Psalm 85. Begin reading verse number 1. The psalmist said, Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin, Selah. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. Turn us, O God of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. Let's pray. Father, we sure do bless you. Thank you for the good song service. Lord, thank you for the message of every song. Thank you for those that use their talent for your honor and for your glory. God, thank you for the good testimonies. Thank you for the good fellowship leading up to service. Thank you for being a good God. Now, Father, I pray for the next few minutes you'd continue to hover around this place and you'd speak to our hearts. Lord, we're seeking you and we're seeking revival. And I pray that tonight some things would be made clear and I pray that tonight it would create a desire and a hunger within each and every one of your children to draw up closer to thee. Father, do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Lord, we cannot work for revival. We cannot wish for revival. We must, uh, Lord, pay the price by doing what you say to do in the scriptures to have revival. Send revival this night. And Lord, may it sustain through the weeks and months to come that we might see many turn to thee and we might see many come to thee through salvation. Bless now, use this unworthy vessel. Thank you for Miss Crystal getting better. Touch her and help her. Thank you that Miss Rhonda and Miss Shannon's doing, doing better. Help them. Lord, continue to help, uh, Lord, and move in people's hearts and lives. We'll thank you for it. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we do pray. Amen and amen. We find in these verses uh, where Israel has uh, been led out of captivity and been led back to her homeland. Notice a few things. We see, first of all, verse number one, a favorable God. He said, Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Now, friend, you and I that sit here in the United States of America, that we've been uh, raised in America, that all we've known is American soil, uh, we don't know what it's like to be a slave. We've never been in bondage unto another government. Uh, we have never been utilized uh, as the labor force to build another nation. Uh, but Israel had... Uh, Israel had been in captivity. Uh, Israel has now raised a couple generations in captivity. Uh, and God has been favorable unto them. Uh, and he has allowed them to come back in, into their land. You say, well, well, if he was a favorable God, why did he allow them to go into captivity in the first place? Uh, Neighbor, it was not God's will for him to go into captivity. God raised up prophet after prophet and preached to them to, to repent of their sin, to turn from their wickedness. They had turned from worshiping God and to turn to worship idols. And they sought, my dear friends, false gods, and they sought wickedness. And they rejected the heeding call of God, and they rejected the warning of God, and they went into captivity but God in his sovereignty God who is long suffering God who is a wonderful God made a way where they got to come back to their homeland uh, preached a message years ago you won't miss the water till the well runs dry some of us never knew how good we had it in America till we got Joe Biden and Kamala Harris maybe God will be favorable to our land in a couple weeks not that we're worthy of it, but maybe he'll be favorable. We see a favorable God. I want you to notice he's a forgiving God. Look in verse number two. 
The Bible says, Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people, and thou hast covered all their sin, Selah. Can I say, it is a blessing tonight if you've been forgiven of God. Amen. It's a blessing if you have been forgiven of God because in the day and age we live in, He doesn't cover our sin, He cleanses us from our sin. Uh, what a blessing, our sins never to be remembered against us anymore. Uh, he is a forgiving God. Uh, and friend, listen, uh, I don't care how far in depths of depravity somebody goes, uh, uh, if they're willing to turn from it, turn to God, He'll forgive them of their sin. What a God we serve. Uh, he he is a favorable God. He allowed us to hear the gospel and he's a forgiving God. If we'll turn and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he will forgive us of our sin. If you say, preacher, I'm saved. I've got good news. If you got sin in your life, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If we'll come and confess our sin unto the Lord. Amen. Now let me help you something. To confess our sin means to acknowledge it and to forsake it. He will not forgive sin if we do not really have a desire to turn from sin. Hmm? I appreciate Brother Jim's testimony. God del delivered him from alcohol. You think he hadn't been tempted from alcohol since then? Hmm? Uh, but I'm glad God, when he forgives us, he gives us what we need to overcome those things that tempt us. May not do it overnight. May not do it in a, in, a, in a couple steps. But I got good news for you. You keep your eyes on Jesus and he'll deliver you all the way from it all. Amen. I'm glad he's a favorable God. He's a forgiving God. Notice that he's a forsaking God. Look what he said in verse 3. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath and, turn, and hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thy anger. Can I say uh, God was angry with his people. Matter of fact, there's a point in Moses' day, he wanted to wipe them off the face of the earth. And because Moses interceded, he didn't. But can, he, can I say that he allowed them to go into captivity to purge them from their sins. Uh, they had to uh, uh, pay a double portion at one point, Isaiah said, for their sin because of how wicked they'd been. Uh, but when they reached the point uh, where that God's forgiveness was bestowed upon them, uh, he forsook his anger. Uh, he forsook his wrath. Uh, he took it away. Uh, and I say, uh, you and I, when we were lost in our sins, uh, we were the enemies of of God. Uh, hey, uh, we were at enmity with God. We were at war with God. Uh, and friend, uh, he was angry with us like he's angry with the wicked every day. Uh, but hey, when we called on him and he forgave us, uh, he forsook his anger. Uh, I'm glad I'm not in his anger tonight. Uh, I'm glad I'm in his good pleasure tonight. Uh, I'm glad I'm in his grace tonight. Uh, I'm glad. Uh, hallelujah. God forsook all those feelings he had against me uh, what a blessing you see if God never had fierce anger against the wicked he'd never allow them to go to hell but he wouldn't be a just God kind of like America some of you in here has got white hair that worked all your lives and you worked and you saved so that when you retired you'd have a little bit and you could survive and you'd have a little bit to live on and everything uh, but you worked for everything you got uh, you worked for that little pea patch that you uh, uh, you mow and you worked for that little garden you put out uh, and you worked for that house that you keep up uh, and you worked for the cars you drive uh, and you worked for everything uh, and today we got folks that want to allow uh, folks to come into our country that never worked for anything uh, and they want to give them health care and they want to give them uh, uh, visas and fancy hotel rooms. I don't know about you but that don't sit well with me. Uh, and listen, uh, God's not going to allow anybody to have a free ride to heaven. Uh, the only way through to heaven is through the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and God is angry with the wicked every day because it was the wicked that caused his son to go to Calvary. And if they don't repent and trust in Christ they'll face the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God for all of eternity because of what they've done to Jesus Christ. They scarred him as he gave his life's blood on Calvary. Amen. But I'm glad he'll forsake that wrath Amen. when we call on him and he saves Amen. us. And then notice the focus toward God. The first three verses is talk about what God did for them. He was favorable to them. He forgave them. He forsook his wrath. All oh, wonderful attributes of God. 
But notice the focus turns in verse number 40, in verse number 4. He says, turn us, O God of our salvation. Notice everything in the first three verses is talking about how God turned from some things. How God was favorable and turned from the sentence and let them get back to their land. How God forgave them of their sin. He turned uh, 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 to them because now uh, they were forgiven. Uh, and how he had forsaken his wrath and his anger that he held against them. Uh, that's all a work of God. And now the psalmist has said, God, you've done all them great things for us. Now turn us to thee. You know what revival is? Not what God can do for us, but what God can do through us by turning us to him. Amen. It's about refocusing. You see, as life goes on and from revival to revival, we're inundated with this world. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. Yes, but you've got to deal with this world. Yeah, you've got to deal with all the wickedness going on all around us. You've got to deal with uh, 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 all the injustice that we see. Uh, 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 isn't it amazing? Uh, uh, you and I go out here, we break the law, we go to jail, and they throw away the key. Uh, but these politicians are caught all the time breaking the law and nothing ever happens to you. I don't know about you, but that don't sit well with me. Right, man. But see, we're faced with all this. We're faced with people that don't know how to drive. We're faced with our kids going to school with other kids that are knuckleheads. Yeah. We're faced with a constant inundation of the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life always Amen. coming at us. Amen. Constantly trying to draw our attention away from God. Amen. I, I might as well get real personal. I only got three points tonight. I don't know about you, but doesn't it aggravate you when folks don't hardly ever come to church, but they'll stand up and brag about all they got and all, all about their sin and how blessed they are? I don't know. That kind of aggravates me. Huh? First of all, you ought to never brag on anything but Jesus. Because right. everything you got came from Him. Right. Amen. But it kind of aggravates me that folks that aren't faithful and they act like we owe them something when they show up. Doesn't aggravate you? Kind of aggravates me. Sure. Huh? Listen, I don't have to come to church. I choose to come to church, and I long to come to church. I don't know about anybody. I need church. I need to hear from heaven. I need to be in the presence of God. I like hanging out with God's people. And I certainly want to make folks welcome when they come to church. But listen, if you're coming because you want a pat on the back, go on down the road. We ought to come and offer up hand claps of praise to Jesus. Huh? Anyway, it just kind of aggravates me. We get in a date all the time. I got to say this. My darling daughter, who spawned from my loins, found the Foster theme song that my wife will never let us sing, but we're going to sing it. I don't know where she found it. Brittany! <laughs> God bless you, Brittany. You know us well. Uh, so if anybody has to repent, we know who. It's this lady's saying, Lord Jesus, help me not to slap somebody today. Huh? That is my new theme song right there. Huh? I've already got it. I've already got a song there to go with. You know, I, we'll start singing. You'll all be shouting and everything. And the next verse is, Lord, please help me not to slap somebody today, even though they deserve it. Huh? Huh? Because I'm telling you, there are days... You just want to put Jesus on the shelf and slap somebody. Huh? Well, you know all that's a sign of? That's a sign of we got our focus wrong. And the psalmist is saying, turn us, O God of our salvation. Amen. You've turned toward us. Now turn us to thee. Amen. Help us, Lord, to, to get invested in this thing yes, yes. to where we're what we should be because you've been more than what you should be. That's what he's saying. And, and, and in verses 5 through 6, we see that this focus is really uh, uh, pinned down. Look what he said in verse 4. Turn us, O God of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Now look at verse 5. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? 
Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again that thy, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Three times in verses 5 and 6 he uses that word wilt. That word wilt in this context means to withdraw, to fade, or to begin. Now look at it again. Verse 5, wilt thou be angry with us forever? He's saying, wilt thou withdraw from us forever? Wilt thou be angry and you just withdraw? Can I say there are churches in our area, churches that once stood for the truth, churches that once thundered praise unto God, church that once did great works for God, uh, but hey, they've got Ichabod stamped on them tonight. Uh, uh, God turned away from them. They got to the point where they no longer sought the Lord. Uh, they got to where they took for granted the things of God. Uh, they got to where they thought it was all about them and not about God. Uh, and God got tired of being tired of them uh, and he withdrew from them. Uh, he said, enough is enough. Uh, I've stands all I can stand I can't stand some more. Uh, and God withdrew and went on down the road. Uh, neighbor, you hear me and hear me well. Uh, we better not take for granted the blessings of God. Uh, we better not take for granted what we have in our church. Uh, we better not take for granted these young people and the talent we have. Uh, we better not take for granted the preachers we have. Uh, all we got to do is start taking it for granted uh, and we'll tempt God to go on down the road and bless somewhere else. Uh, he said, wilt thou be angry? with us forever wilt thou withdraw thyself look what he said he said there in the, uh, uh, verse number 5 wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations that's, a, that's where that word uh, wilt means fade wilt thou draw out wilt thou fade uh, your anger from this generation to the next generation to the next generation just carry it out hey we don't preach on this anymore uh, but you know your sin can be carried out to the thir second third generation uh, your children your grandchildren can suffer because of your sin uh, Hey, uh, again, a lot of churches are in a mess today uh, because their fathers a few years ago uh, uh, chose to go a different direction than what the Bible says. Uh, they started heaping to themselves. Uh, teachers having itching ears. Uh, and tonight their churches are in a mess. Uh, and God has faded out his anger and carried it down uh, uh, from generation to generation. Uh, listen, uh, I'm thankful for household salvation. Uh, I'm thankful for generational salvation uh, but listen friend uh, uh, if we don't get right and have revival it'll affect the next generation uh, and then we find the third time he uses wilts in verse 6 wilt thou not revive us again now that word again means he's revived them before and he said wilt thou not revive us again and in that context the definition of the word wilt is the word begin Wilt thou not begin revival again? What a blessing. We're at the threshold of God may be beginning a great revival at Emmanuel Baptist Church. God help us to settle for nothing less than true old-fashioned Holy Ghost revival. In order to have it, we've got to pay the cost of it. We've got to pray for it. We've got to seek the Lord for it. We've got to mind the Lord when he walks through here and does some things. But friend, you not have revival. Just show it up here and there and whenever you want to. Amen. How sad would it be if her little granddaughter shows up bragging about how good God's been around here and none of these young people are here? Hmm. There's great responsibility sure, in having revival. Amen, Pastor. So this is what I want to preach on tonight. I hear a lot of things about revival and this revival and that revival. Listen, if it's revival, <laughs> it'll sustain itself. You don't have to tell anybody it's revival. Hmm? Yes, and by the way, you can't have revival in three days. No, it takes three days to just get the bark off of us. We didn't get where we are in three days, and it ain't, it's going to take longer than three days to get us closer to God. I guarantee you that. But this is what I want to preach on. I want to preach on three evidences of revival. Some things that you can absolutely mark it down. There's evidence that you're in a state of revival. Can I say the first evidence of true 
old-fashioned, heaven-sent revival is there will be a loyalty to the Savior. He will become uh, the object of our affection. We will put nothing else before Him. We will become so loyal to Him uh, because we realize how, how much we need Him and how great He is, uh, how worthy He is of our praise. Uh, listen to me, don't tell me uh, uh, you're all in on revival and you only show up one night. Amen. That's not evidence of revival. The evidence of revival is you're getting closer to Him. There is a loyalty of the Savior. Now listen, I'm going to upset somebody right here. Don't really give, give a rip because I want to slap somebody today. It's a great song. Hear me and hear me well. You can't love the Savior and not be loyal to the Savior. Amen. He said... If you love me, keep my commandments. Right. Your love's not right for the Savior if you're not loyal to the Savior. You say, well, I love Jesus, preacher. Prove it. Amen. Amen. Where I come from, proof's in the pudding. And if your love's right, your loyalty will be right. right. You will love him above all others and above all other things. We have some ladies sitting in here tonight uh, and they have chosen to forsake their spouse uh, because they are more loyal to their Savior than their spouse. Uh, I never ask them, uh, but I just kind of think uh, there are days there are pressures on them uh, not to come to church, uh, not to put the Lord first, uh, not to come out to revival meeting, uh, not to come out to the Bible Institute, uh, but they have made up their minds. Uh, they have drawn a line in the sand. Uh, I love Jesus. Uh, Jesus has changed my life. Uh, I'm going to be loyal to the Savior. Uh, Come on, me. Hey, there's a love strong cord that cannot be broken. And when that cord is right, you'll be loyal to the one under hanging the other end of the rope, my dear friends. Uh, listen, loyalty is exemplified in being true to Jesus. You can't love him if you're not true to him. Loyalty is exemplified in being tied to Jesus. Everywhere you go, he goes. Everywhere he goes, you go. You're tied to him. Huh? You know what I like it? I like it when people say, Brother Doug and Sister Annette, we're just kind of tied together. Huh? We've been together 36 years. Most of the time you see one of us, you see the other. Huh? We're just tied together. Hey, I've been, I've been tied to Jesus for 50 years. Huh? Everywhere I go, he goes with me, and people ought to see him. Are you listening? Right. You can't be lo love right. Uh, loyalty comes with being true to him. Uh, he said, uh, 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 forsake not the assembling of ourselves together so much more as you see the day approaching. What's he talking about? His coming. We don't need less church. We need more church. Uh, it's amazing how many churches don't have Sunday night service, uh, don't have midweek service. Uh, we need to have more church. Uh, this thing isn't getting better. It's getting worse out there. Uh, we need to get closer to God. Uh, hey, we ought to be true to him. Uh, we ought to be tied to him. Uh, and can I say, uh, loyalty is exemplified in trusting fully in Jesus. Uh, I just don't trust him when I need something. Amen. I trust him every day. Yeah. Amen. Because without him, I can do nothing. Can I say, an evidence of true heaven dispatch sent revival is there will be a loyalty to the Savior. Hmm? I guarantee you there's folks that are members of our church that don't even know we're starting revival next month or next week. Amen. Even though we've been announcing it for months because that's not where their loyalty lies. Yes, sir. Hmm. God help us. Don't pound your chest and tell somebody how spiritual you are when you can't even find your way to church. Amen. Hmm. By the way, coming to church don't make you spiritual, but it's a good step in the right direction. Amen. Amen, Pastor. Hmm. An evidence of revival is a loyalty to the Savior. You hear me, the second point tonight, a true evidence of heaven-sent revival 
is there'll be a loathing of sin. Yes. Amen. Too many churches today are trying to embrace sin. I appreciate my friend Brother Jim telling me a couple weeks ago about the Methodists having a night, have a beer with a queer. That was a real blessing to my soul. That's what it was, wasn't it? Huh? I'm not making that up. Huh? Embracing sin. You notice how many of these denominational churches uh, have rainbow flags. Uh, welcome them all in. Uh, they want their numbers. They want their nickels. Uh, they want to, uh, uh, to be all inclusive. Uh, well, I got good news for you. Jesus is all inclusive. Uh, he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, Jesus tasted death for every man. Uh, Jesus is willing to save every man uh, but just like Miss Marcy sang uh, just like the youngin sang uh, when Jesus saves you he changes you he don't leave you in your sin anymore uh, he changes you makes a new creature out of you uh, what a blessing uh, I, tonight uh, I may uh, still be in the depravity of my flesh uh, and Paul said it right oh wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from this body of death uh, but I've got good news uh, I may not always be what I should be but I'm not what I used to be because uh, Jesus saved me uh, and made a new creature out of me uh, when folks get saved they start loving the things God loves and start hating the things God hates. And by the way, God hates some things. He hates pride. Uh, seven things he hates. He hates people who sow discord among the brethren. So Brother Seth, if you get to talking about Brother Ray to somebody else to try and get somebody else to hate Brother Ray, God will hate you. Hate that sin in you. He hates some things. And see, when you get saved, you'll love the things God loves and you'll start hating the things God hates. You know what he hates? He hates sin. Hates sin in people. That's why he sent his son to deliver us from our sin. And listen, we fail the grace of God every day, but we don't have to live there. Amen. Right? Well, I got to thinking about the loathing of sin. First of all, there's a loathing of personal sin. If revival comes, you'll hate the sin that is in you. Amen. You'll hate thoughts that the devil puts in your head. Yeah. You'll hate the things that you're tempted to do even if you don't do them. You'll hate sin in yourself. And if you step in a mud puddle, you'll feel guilty and you'll hate that. And you'll want to get that thing cleaned up because uh, you'll hate your sin. Uh, people that can sin and embrace it and it doesn't bother them, they haven't had revival. Listen to what Paul said, and I alluded to it a second ago. Paul said in Romans 7, verse 18, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would do, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, that I would not, it is no more that I do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Uh, I find then a law uh, uh, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Now in verse 24, he said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Paul said, uh, I have two natures. Uh, I have the, uh, the spiritual nature of the Holy Ghost in me, and I have this fleshly nature, and I find this uh, 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 war within me. Uh, I find that there are times when I would do good, and Instead of doing that, I don't do that. And there are times when I'm tempted to do evil, and when I wouldn't do that, I end up doing that. Uh, and he said, it's a constant struggle, and it's a war. Uh, and he said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? What he is saying is, uh, it takes spending time with God. Uh, it takes saturating your mind with the Scriptures. Uh, it takes walking in the Spirit. Uh, it takes feeding the inner man more than you feed the fleshly man. Uh, and the inner man will be stronger, and he'll overcome those temptations of the fleshly man uh, Paul said I hate when I don't do what I should do uh, we'll loathe our personal sin the Bible said in Psalms 58 too yea in heart ye work wickedness ye weigh the violence of your hands in the earth see sin you think about it long enough it'll conceive in your heart and then you'll do it hmm You'll hate that. You'll hate when you sin. You'll hate when your attitude's not right. You'll hate 
when your spirituality isn't right. You'll hate when you come to church uh, and you've not got that touch on you. You'll hate your personal sin and evidence of revival shows that you hate those things in your life. Psalm 19 verse 12 says, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. The psalmist said to keep me back from presumptuous sins. What's he talking about? Uh, presumptuous means willful, bold, irreverent with respect to sacred things. Uh, having a presumptuous sin is where you can live in your sin. You teach yourself not to bother you. Uh, in so much as you go ahead and boastfully do it uh, and are disrespectful to sacred things knowing God's against it. There are people that come to church and sing that song, Oh, how I love Jesus, but in their heart they haven't lived for Jesus. And in their heart they have no business of giving up their sin. That's presumption. Or what will happen? The devil will tempt you with it and you get this mindset. Well, I'll go ahead and do it. God will forgive me anyway. No, he won't. Not till you turn and forsake from it. And when true revival breaks out, you'll hate even having those thoughts. Amen. There's a loathing of personal sin. Now, how many of you believe in accidents and coincidences and chances and things just happen out of chance? Now, I believe in the sovereign hand of God, don't you? Sure. I believe God's in control. I believe nothing caught God by surprise. Well, after we prayed, I went back to get my Bible out of... Uh, uh, my office, get my Bible, my iPad, get ready to come for service. And uh, uh, my phone buzzed. And usually I don't check it, but it's just kind of an odd time. And I'm figuring it's, uh, you know, Trump trying to get money out of me. You know what my sorry, no good, smart aleck son that's uh, at his in-laws did to me? He signed me up to receive Kamala Harris texts. <laughs> Give money to Kamala. Give money. They, they call me. I hear you're supporting Kamala. No. <laughs> if he didn't weigh 250 pounds, I'd pick him up, take him to the woodshed, and smack him around a little bit. Uh, but it was just an odd thing. But I looked at my phone. It was from a preacher friend of mine. Uh, Brother Adrian knows him, Brother Frankie Reeves. Brother Frankie sent me a text. This is what Brother Frankie said, not knowing what I'm preaching on tonight. Uh, but this was just an accident. Huh? Frankie says, one reason we don't have revival is our heads are full of doctrine, but our feet stink. Nothing smells worse than unwashed feet. I thought that was pretty profound. And that's our problem. We come in, we know all the songs. That's why we sing them without any excitement. We know the Bible. We've been taught doctrine, so we think we're not going to hear anything we've never heard before. And so we come and we sit. We don't get excited. Nothing stirs us because uh, our heads are full, uh, but our feet stink. We've been walking around in the world uh, and our, our feet uh, have a staunch going up to the nostrils of God and God doesn't show up. God doesn't bless because uh, we've got stinky feet. God help us, huh? Amen. One fellow said this years ago, a head that leaks won't swell. Amen. That's good. Our heads are so full because it's been a long time since we've wept over anything. Maybe the reason we don't have revival is we're so lifted with pride. Maybe God has to break us. Listen, I have no doubt the Lord wants to send revival because his Bible tells me so. And I have no doubt the devil's fearful of revival because there's about eight families that I've been dealing with since Tuesday about things going on where they've just had things dropped on them. So it's the devil trying to get folks distracted. It might be the Lord trying to break some folks so they'll get rid of their stinking pride and get their feet washed. Mm. That's good. We don't sing them songs, Lord break me. I remember that one Bill girl you used to get up and sing, sing that song about Lord Break Me. And then Sydney's got a song about Lord Break Me. We don't sing one of them. We sing them song, Lord Bless Me. Maybe if we get our feet washed, he'll bless us. Just saying. Amen. I'm just saying an evidence of revival is the loathing of sin. Not only personal sin, but public sin. 
I've alluded to some sin today, tonight already. It's going on in the world. But listen to what happened in the Bible. God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 44, 9. Have you forgotten the wickedness of your fathers and the wickedness of the kings of Judah and the wickedness of their wives and your own wickedness and the wickedness of your wives which they have committed in the land of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? Listen, we may get numb to the sin going on in this world. We may get numb to what's going on and all the wickedness that is heralded, but there's one who never gets numb to it. It's the Lord. Uh, and when true revival does break out, uh, we'll loathe public sin. That's why I get on it so much. Uh, I know some of you get tired of me talking about mashed potato brains uh, and cackling Kamala. They're just two byproducts of what's going on in this world. Uh, 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 there's a lot of wickedness, uh, spiritual wickedness in high places. Uh, our fight isn't with flesh and blood, but this uh, uh, sorry no good devil is working through flesh and blood, uh, and it's going throughout the world, uh, and somebody needs to stand up against it. Uh, the psalmist said in Psalm 55 and 11, uh, Wicked is, wickedness is in the midst thereof. Uh, deceit and guile depart not from her streets. Uh, uh, listen, we're living in that day and age. Uh, we're living in a day and age where all people are looking for is a party. Uh, we ought to live in a country where few people are looking for purity. Uh, but we don't see that because uh, it doesn't thunder from our pulpits anymore. Uh, and people People aren't living pure lives uh, for Jesus in this world. Uh, so the world has no measuring stick to aspire to. Uh, true revival will make us the envy of the world. They'll desire what we have. There'll be a loathing of, of your personal sin and public sin, but also pious sin. Mm, can I say, preachers ought to know better. We live in a day and age where preachers are as wicked as anybody. Amen. There are preachers that are committing heinous sins, try to cover it up, and they wonder what's, going, what's wrong with our churches. Amen. It's not new. That's why I call out some of them like Brother Joel. He's not a brother. He's wicked. But these people are in positions behind so-called pulpits if they still have one, and people are looking to them for answers and they're living horrible lives, wicked lives. But up in front of the cameras, they sure do sound real sweet. Yes. Mm. Joe wrote that book, Every Day is a Friday. No, some days are Mondays. Right. And Monday ain't a Friday. Amen. But listen to what happened in Jeremiah's day, in Jeremiah 2.8. The priest said not, where is the Lord? And they that handled the law knew me not. Listen to that. Those that stood up and handled the scripture knew me not. Uh, the pastors also transgressed against me. And the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Uh, can I say, uh, we have name it, claim it religions. Uh, they'll say, send us a thousand dollars. God will send you ten thousand. Uh, buy my little uh, uh, bottle of water that came out of some stream in Jerusalem. It It'll heal you. Uh, get one of my prayer calls. Get this. Get this. this is all filthy lucre. Uh, 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 can I say Jesus didn't come and ask anything from anybody? Uh, he came and freely gave himself. Uh, freely gave the gospel. Uh, he freely offers grace. Uh, uh, Jesus isn't interested in what we can do for him. Uh, he's interested in what he can do for us. Uh, and the church ought to be interested uh, in getting the gospel out uh, and helping folks uh, and loving folks where they're at. Uh, right. Amen, Pastor. Jeremiah, Jeremiah also said chapter 32, verse 33, and they have turned unto me the back and not the face. Though I taught them, rising up early and teaching them, yet have they not hearkened to receive instruction. But they set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name, to defile it. Uh, and they build high places of Baal uh, and are in the valleys of the son of Hinnom to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Molech, uh, which I commanded them not. Neither came it into my mind uh, that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. And can I say, when you got... Seven Hills, and by the way, if you go to a church called Seven Hills, you haven't studied your Bible. <laughs> that city set up on Seven Hills in Revelation is wicked. Right. If you go to a church called Corinthian Baptist Church, you haven't studied your Bible. That was the most carnal church recorded in Scripture. Yeah. But because it sounds good, people do that. But Seven Hills had a 
festival today and they offered everybody bring your kids we'll give them pumpkins and we'll have all kinds of booths and we'll have all kinds of this and, and what they offered was sacrilege and then they just tie the name of Jesus on top of it to make it all look pretty Amen. and I say God hates that stuff do you know what God said he said he chose through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe Amen. Amen. God help us there will be the evidence of loyalty to the Savior true revival breaks out there'll be an evidence for the loathing of sin if true revival breaks out and then lastly there'll be the evidence of longing to see sinners saved that's an evidence that's the last commission Jesus gave the church before he ascended back to heaven to take the gospel to every creature yes. and when there's true revival that breaks out there'll be a longing to see people saved yes sir Listen, revival is not to see people saved. People that are lost in their sin have never been made alive. How can they be revived? Revival's for the church. And as an evidence of revival coming to the church, people will get saved. Because folks have a longing to see people saved. They'll tell people about Jesus. They'll take tracts out to people. They'll invite people to come. People will see revival in that person and say, I want what they've got. There'll be a longing to see people saved and folks will get saved. Listen, if true revival breaks out, there'll be a cry for sinners. We'll cry to them. We'll plead with them. Come, see a man that told me all things ever I've done. Remember when you first got saved? One of the first evidences you got saved, you couldn't wait to tell somebody you got saved. Amen. What happened to you? Time, trials, obstacles, flesh, your joy is dwindled. When you first got saved, that's all you knew was joy and love. And you wanted everybody to have it. You got frustrated because they couldn't see it. But you couldn't see it until Jesus showed you. But you wanted to tell everybody. When true revival breaks out, you'll have that longing again. You'll plead. You'll cry for sinners. Come, meet the Lord. He'll change your life. There'll be a cry for sinners. And can I say this? There'll be a cry toward sinners will cry unto the Lord asking Him to save sinners. Yeah. Remember when you used to lose sleep because you had a burden to see somebody saved? What happened? Remember when you used to weep because you had a loved one who was going to die and go to hell? Remember when it bothered you that people around you weren't saved? See, when revival breaks out, it'll bother you again. You'll start talking to the Lord about them. You'll start telling the Lord on them. Jesus, my loved one needs to be saved. And Jesus, I don't know what it's going to take, but send somebody, put somebody in their path. Lord, do something in their heart. Break them where they can't enjoy their sin anymore. Jesus, take their sleep away from them to where they can't sleep because they're worried about dying and going to hell. You'll start praying stuff like that when true revival breaks out. It's an evidence. So you'll cry for sinners to come. You'll cry toward sinners by talking to the Lord over them. And then lastly, you'll cry over sinners. You won't be able to enjoy your lunch at lunchtime walking, watching sinners drive down the road lost. I used to work in a shopping center and I'd take my lunch and I'd sit out in the middle of the shopping center and just look at people and say, there's no hope for them. Lord, touch that person's heart. God, that person's going to die and go to hell. God, do something in that person's life. See, when true revival comes and you're walking with the Lord, you start weeping over them again. When Jesus come up over on Jerusalem, he looked down on Jerusalem, he wept over Jerusalem, thinking about all the prophets he had sent to warn them, and they rejected him. And they rejected him. And he thought about how many times he would have redeemed Israel. But Israel would not. And can I say that same spirit of Jesus comes through the spirit of revival. And we will weep over them too. I shudder to think to ask people, 
are you revived? Because we're all tempted to lie. We're in church. We don't want to look bad. But the truth is, it'll show on you when you are. There'll be loyalty to the Savior. There'll be a loathing of sin and a longing to see sinners saved. Our question ought to be, Lord, wilt thou not revive us again? God, turn us to thee. Because, Lord, you're the only hope for this world. And, friend, whether or not you believe it, you and I might be on the front lines, the final straw that keeps hell from taking over this world. And the only hope is revival. God help us to settle for nothing less than true revival. Brother Clayton, you go. So I'll stand. Let's pray, Father. Help us, Lord, to settle for nothing less than Jesus and his righteousness. God, revive us. We're not worthy of your revival, but we do long for it. God, break our hearts for you. Break our hearts over sin. and Break our hearts for sinners. God, do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Lord, open the scales of our eyes and help us to see where we are. And help us to see where you long for us to be. God, do a work that can be only attributed to your hand of grace. Now, God, bless. God, breathe. And God, have your way. We'll bless you for Jesus' name. Amen. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.